God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So good to be with you tonight, and it's good to see each of you here. We have a really good number here tonight. I'm thankful for that. I feel I should take just a few moments and tell you a couple of things of encouragement regarding our live streaming this morning. We had at least three of our members who were not able to be here due to sickness who contacted us and said that they were, they were with us online and were able to watch it, uh, watch the service from, uh, from where they were at home. Brother Terry Thomas, for one, uh, and uh, also a couple of others who were not able to be here. And uh, they were very complimentary of the live stream and the quality of that product. And I just I appreciate Brother John so much in the work he's done in, in getting this uh, s to such a professional level so that our members who are not able to be here can tune in and actually uh, watch the service and listen live. I want to also mention something about the online giving feature because there were some questions about that. And in your bulletin today on the back page is a little note entitled, How to Use Live Streaming on Our Church Website. You'll see in that spot a little note each week for a few weeks as we try to explain the different features of that website. This one tells you how to use the live streaming. Very easy to use. You just go to the member section and enter the password, which is Romans with a capital R. We want all of our hearers to know that. We want all of our members to know that so they can tune in and uh, watch it live stream. But also a feature there has to do with the giving, online giving. I want you to know that our elders are serious about following the scriptural commandments with regard to giving. This is not intended as a solicitation or commercialization. It is an opportunity for members who cannot get out, say somebody who is homebound, they can still give and they can do so electronically rather than with a paper check. And if you prefer to give electronically rather than with a check, you could do that too, but it's designed primarily for those who are not able to get out to services but they still want to give. We are not soliciting funds, we're not going into business, it's not a commercialization in any way, but it is a way to allow people to give who want to do so. And I know that a number have already taken advantage of that, and that's a good thing. Brethren, we've been looking at the book of 1 Corinthians on Sunday nights, and uh, this is a timely book for any age, but it's especially appropriate for our age. And that's why when we're considering the book, we've been doing so with an emphasis upon today and an emphasis upon today's issues and today's problems. When I look out across the crowd here or whoever may be listening online, I see that we're, we're dealing with modern, current issues of concern. And it's as if the Apostle Paul was writing uh, to 21st century America. And so we looked at an introduction. Uh, we saw about the Apostle himself, the city, and the church at Corinth, a brief outline of the book. And then we looked at the first section, and I gave you three points to ponder from that first section involving encouraging one another, which we are to do. Uh, also looking forward to what it's all about, our Judgment Day and beyond, and then the fact that the physical death of the Christian is not, certainly not the end of the Christian experience and the Christian story. In chapter 1, verses 10 through chapter 6, verse 20, we have the first major section of the book where Paul is dealing with concerns that have been brought to his attention by them that are of the household of Chloe, and he starts in that section with an appeal for unity. This is uh, a section of text that is required reading for every Christian. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you. Unity, 
And we've talked at some length about that because it is so very important. And it is sort of the foundation for all of the other issues that Paul will deal with. So an appeal for unity. And within that section, chapter 1, verse 10, 10 through 17, we saw the use of the word brethren as a tender and affectionate term and that he appealed by the name of or the authority of Jesus Christ, that there's room for different ways of expressing the truth, but we all need to be together on the word of God, that we all need to be in the truth and in the word of the same mind and the same judgment of the same attitude. And in verse 11, he identifies his source, and he says, It hath been signified to me by them that are of the household of Chloe. That's good practice for us. Verse 12, he specifies clearly the problem. So there's no beating around the bush. He identifies clearly what he's talking about so that we can all focus together in this appeal for unity. There should be no factionalism in the church. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. I am of Christ. And, and in some congregations today, you hear that. Well, I'm following brother so-and-so, or I'm following uh, brother uh, so-and-so's book, or brother so-and-so's teaching on this. No, we're following Jesus Christ. And it's not a, it's not a case of factionalism in, in the church of our Lord. Verse 13, that series of rhetorical questions to show the, the foolishness of that kind of thinking. And verses 14 through 16, he says, I really don't remember whether I baptized any other, which shows us that inspiration didn't mean that he knew everything, that he was all-knowing. Verse 17, the importance of being baptized versus the importance of the baptizer. It's being saved that counts, regardless of who has the pleasure of baptizing each of us. We need to be watchful of those not-but phrases. If you kind of get that concept in your mind, it makes it so much easier to understand passages such as this and a number of other passages, which we talked about last week. And someone asked me, uh, are there three parties or are there four at Corinth? I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. I am of Christ. Some believe that when they said, I am of Christ, that that was the true and proper attitude, that there were only three parties. But it may very well be that even those who were saying that they were of Christ were displaying an attitude of factionalism because Paul says at the beginning of that, now this I mean that each one of you saith. And then he goes on to list these four parties, if you will. Just saying that I'm of Christ doesn't make me of Christ. We need to actually follow in unity the gospel of Jesus Christ. So whether it was three or whether it was four, factionalism is not acceptable. Paul says there's to be none of that in the Lord's church, and I beg you to remember that. He says, I beseech you to do so. Is it ever okay to leave a congregation, to break the unity, if you will, We've been stressing unity, and Paul stresses unity. Someone says, well, is it ever possible to leave a congregation? If you stop and think about it, you see probably even in the experience of either in your own or those loved ones that you may know, that there may come a time where a group of people, God's people, depart from the truth. And you may find yourself standing alone, as it were, or standing against the, the, the current toward digression. And you may find that in order to be faithful, you have to leave that train of thought, that, that digression, if you will. It's a sad thing to me to, to observe what has been going on across the brotherhood in a number of places. When you see once great congregations that were so on fire for the Lord and so faithful and strong, but which have in the words of our Lord, left their first love. Is it possible that a congregation could go astray in which you are a member and you would have to, for the sake of being faithful to yourself, you would have to leave that congregation? Oh, yes. And I hope and pray it never happens to you. A heartbreaking, heart-rending experience. We're to follow our Lord Jesus Christ at all costs. Let God be true, though all men be found to be a liar. 
We must stand for that which is right. But may I suggest to you, brethren, that the vast majority of differences and issues which seem to be coming up in congregations these days are not over some doctrinal matter of faith. They are over personalities. They are over matters of opinion, matters of expediency, matters that should be resolved and worked through. I should not be of a mindset, well, if I don't get my way, I'm just going to leave. Or if, well, if we don't do it this way, I'm just going to take my family and I'm going to leave. You see, that's, that's not Christian unity. That's precarious hanging on. And it is doomed to failure. Because there will come a time, brethren, where you or I will not get our way. Right? If you've been in the church any length of time, you've, you've already experienced this. There are things that are said or done or decided that, you, you, well, you wouldn't have just done it that way. But we make a commitment to unity to follow our Lord and almost never, may I say to you in all kindness, almost never is it necessary for a brethren to leave a congregation. The one exception, as I said, would be if that congregation were to depart from the faith go into error, you must stand true regardless. I wanted to, at the end of the last uh, session, I uh, wanted to share with you three points to ponder. And I had put these on the screen very briefly, so let me just discuss these briefly with us this evening. And this lesson will be yours. When you need to correct someone, by all means, do it tenderly. And you say, well, I don't think it's my role to correct somebody. Well, not so fast. What did our Lord do? Are there not many times in his life where he found it necessary to gently reprove, to correct, to admonish? Teaching itself is a form of correction, brethren. And we're all commanded to teach. Jesus said, go ye therefore into all the world and teach all nations. We cannot escape our duty to correct error. Paul told the brethren at Ephesians to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather even reprove them. The word reprove means to Bring it to light. Show their dangerous character. And brethren, that's a job that we all have. One of the problems in some congregations today is that some brethren have forgotten their duty of correction. And so they just sort of float along, you know, not wanting to rock the boat. Those congregations are in trouble. We need a little boat rocking particularly when we're in error, when we're off in the wrong channel. We need to get back into the channel that's correct. And so we need a loving brother or sister to gently correct us. And that may be you. But when you do it, try to do it gently, tenderly, with respect, recognizing that you're dealing with a soul that is going to live forever. And you want to make sure that you treat this with kid gloves and with the respect that it is due. He says, I beseech you. You can picture that the Apostle Paul would, if, if it were necessary, get down on his knees and beg them. And he, and he uses the term brethren. Remember, we're all on the same team. We, we might not see eye to eye on some insignificant matter of opinion. You know, but, but we're going to remain on the same team. We're brethren. The live streaming that we're doing here is designed to draw brethren closer together, even those who cannot be here physically. 
to give them the opportunity to join in and to participate at least in, in the hearing and the seeing of the worship of God so that they themselves can participate. I had a message from a, a sister in another congregation some distance from here who had watched, tuned into our live stream last week. And she was commenting, what a, what a joy that is and a, and a privilege, a blessing to be able to do that. Now, it's not an invitation to just stay home. Now, what Jonathan does, he goes back in his office and watches the live stream. <laughs> well, he told me that. He told me that. No, I'm certainly kidding about that. But, but it's not an opportunity to forsake the assembly or to leave, but it is an opportunity to draw together and to pool closer in our fellowship, in our worship to God. Uh, working together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And remember that. We are brethren. So if you need to correct someone, think about their soul. Think about doing so uh, privately or off to the side, out of earshot of others. Don't go up to them in the foyer and put a finger in their face and so that others can see and hear that you're doing it. Think, what are you doing? Uh, would you be persuaded if someone talked to you that way? Probably not. It would probably make you angry and resentful if someone talked to you that way. The Apostle Paul is figuratively getting down on his knees and beseeching them and saying, please, please do this. This is important. And that should be the attitude of us all when it comes to correction. Another point here that we should be considering very consistently is that denominationism is not only a, an unwise arrangement, it is sinful. The Apostle Paul says, I beseech you that there be no divisions among you. Among who? Among God's people. And when Jesus prayed there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, that they all may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, he and I in thee, that they also may be one, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Unity is not optional. It's not a luxury. It's commanded and required. It is wrong to splinter the Lord's body in the church and to start man-made churches. That, that, that's sinful. I say that the existence of our current religious world to the contrary notwithstanding. I know there may be people listening who are in some denomination, who hold membership in some man-made church, and maybe even call themselves after that man by name. We would urge them to reconsider what they're doing. We would lovingly point out that division is wrong. And the word denomination simply means a division. You take a $100 bill and go into a bank and say, I, I, I would like you to divide this for me. Well, they're not going to take out a pair of scissors and cut it up. At least I hope they don't. You, you want it changed into its constituent parts. They may say, well, what denominations would you like? Well, I'd like, you know, I'd like four 20s and I'd like a 10 and a couple of fives. These are denominations. That's the concept of denominationalism. And today, we, we have people trying to argue that, that denominationalism or division is actually a good thing because you can pick whichever one suits you. Isn't that a shame? Listen, following Jesus Christ is not like going through the horn and horn cafeteria and picking and choosing what we want to eat. It is humbly submitting to God's menu. 
not picking and choosing my own and rejecting the rest. Division is wrong. Denominationalism is sinful. And for a long time, I have come to believe, and, and the more I discuss and study it, the more firmly, I must tell you, I believe that this is one of Satan's best tools. It's just like what Jesus said, that the world may believe. Well, what happens when they look out and they see all this fractured Christianity and, and denominations? Do they believe? I'm going to tell you right now, they don't believe. They see through that. They say, well, if this, if this is what Christianity is, I don't want any part of that. i got enough division and strife in my own life. I don't need division and strife in, in religion, too. And so they choose not to even discuss it with you. Do you ever hear the old saying, don't discuss religion or politics? Some people believe that. Our, our Lord didn't believe that. He was ready to discuss any subject with any honest person. And sometimes a good, healthy discussion of religion is very, very necessary and important. But if there's division every which way, then people aren't going to want to talk about it. It's, it's just not going to be pleasant to them at all. So, by all means, denominationalism is sinful. Now, may I say to you in kindness, brethren, there's something else that's sinful too. We sometimes call it preacheritis. You know what preacheritis is? One time... Uh, there was a congregation that had a great preacher. I did not know him personally, but I came to know him through other means, others and listening to recordings and, and talking to others. I came to develop a great respect for him. And he was a great preacher, a great man of God. But like all men, he didn't live forever. And one day, he was out working on his uh, uh, antique automobile in a garage by himself, and they found him dead. And that was the end of his earthly work. His life on this earth ended, but the life of the body of Christ, the church, had to go on. And then another preacher comes along, and guess what? He wasn't the same. They never are. This first preacher was beloved. Some in the congregation, I think they believed that he could literally walk on water. He was a great man of God. And guess what? The second preacher couldn't walk on water. Not only that, he didn't have the same strengths, the same areas where he would excel, the same uh, apparent tenderness and compassion and likability that the first preacher had. And so guess what some of the members did? That's right, they quit coming. They dropped out. Some years later, after that second preacher was gone, some of us would try to go and visit some of these brethren that had dropped out. Why? Now, they wouldn't say this, but you know what the reason always came down to? Well, because brother so-and-so is no longer there. That first preacher is no longer there. You mean you haven't been coming since, since he died? Well, I came for a little while, but I just, I just, I guess I kind of dropped out. Do you know, brethren, that what we're saying when we follow a preacher rather than follow our Lord is we are elevating the preacher above the Lord? That's called preacheritis, and it is deadly. I implore you, if there was, if there was anyone inclined to follow me or to uh, come just because I'm coming... I would beg you to reconsider that. If something were to happen to me this evening, and this were my last sermon to preach, 
I would hope and pray that you would be just as faithful and strong next assembly as you are now. Stronger. Because your faith is stayed in Jesus Christ and not in any man. This is an especial danger to new converts. It's only natural to have a certain affection and respect for the person who taught you the gospel. And that's what Paul was talking about when, when he said, maybe it's a good thing that I didn't baptize more of you. Because then you would be following, more of you would probably be following after me, that the way you're thinking. Preacher-itis. Our faith must be in Jesus Christ. So ask yourself, if preacher so-and-so would be gone tomorrow, or his wife, who's probably a lot more likable than he is anyway, or maybe one of the Bible school teachers that I really, really like. I mean, I just love that teacher. Or dear, sweet sister so-and-so, who's always there with a word of encouragement. It, whoever it is, if they were gone, would you still be faithful and committed in the work of the church? Ask yourself that. Think about that. That's the question that we need to be able to answer affirmatively. So, denominationalism, sin, uh, sinful uh, division, preacheritis, factionalism, all of these things need to be carefully avoided. And let's just remember who we're following and who we're not following. Now, uh, does that mean that we can't have res great respect for a preacher? I, I remember, you know, have, having gospel meetings. We've had gospel meetings here for years in this congregation. And we've had some really fine gospel preachers come in here and hold gospel meetings. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell the elders, Jonathan, I think we should quit doing that because I get a little insecure every time we have a gospel meeting. <laughs> I mean, we really have some good guys come in here. No, but seriously, uh, does that mean we can't have respect for them? Of course not. Does it mean we shouldn't uh, read after them or maybe buy their books or their materials or follow them online or read their articles, benefit from their scholarship and their experience? Of course, that's, that's certainly proper to do. But no matter who we respect, we follow Jesus Christ. Paul would say to this same congregation later in chapter 11 and verse 1, he would say it this way, Be ye imitators of me, even as I am of Jesus Christ. You see what he's saying there? As long as I'm following Christ, you can imitate me. But if I should ever stop following Christ, or if I should die or something like that, you just keep going right on following Christ. Lastly, before we close, I sometimes tell people these points if with regard to our Christian colleges. It's the same principle. We say, oh, well, you, you, you really love such and such Christian college. Yes, and with good reason. There are very good reasons many times why people respect and admire a particular Christian college. But there are Christian colleges that began faithful and strong that no longer hold to their original purpose. I mean, there are those who have long since left their, their founding principles. That just seems to be an unfortunate tendency in the institutions of men. They kind of get away from the sacrifices that made them possible in the first place. So, yeah, we have brethren here who have children who are attending a particular Christian school. That's a wonderful thing. And, and I admire that. And, I, and, and should you support that school? Oh, yes. But today... I'm talking about today, not necessarily tomorrow. It depends on the school and, and whether they are sound and faithful and continue to be that way on into the future. Follow Christ and his principles. Follow those who follow Christ. Support those institutions which are promoting 
the principles of Christianity in Christ. Support them. But don't be blindly loyal to any of them. And if they depart, let them depart, but follow Christ. Okay? This evening, if you are subject to our Lord's invitation, we have a special uh, opportunity when assembled like this, having, having considered these important principles from the Word of God, to bring our lives into alignment with His Word, if, if such be needed, here this evening. If you are here this evening and have not repented of your sins and confessed your faith before men and been baptized into Christ, this would be the perfect time to tend to that, to take care of that. It has eternal significance, and it is vitally important. Why not this evening make the commitment? Think about your family. Think about your children. If you have children, think about those who are looking to you for strength and for guidance, and follow Jesus Christ. I know there are some in, in this number this evening who need to do this. Jonathan and I will be here at the front to assist you in your obedience. Think about the words of the Apostle Paul, that you all speak the same thing and be of the same mind. Why not get on board with Jesus Christ and support the others who are doing, doing likewise? If we may assist you in rendering obedience to the gospel this evening, or if you've done these things but have wandered away and need to come back in penitence returning tonight, why not now, while together we stand and sing?